As human beings, one of the areas of responsibility in this life we oftentimes struggle with is maintaining or really strengthening those critical relationships that we have amongst one another. And it begins in the home, the relationship we have with our spouse as husband and wife or between parents and children. You think about the relationships we have in the workplace, we as the employee to our employer. But above all, in the church, as God's spiritual family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christians. As humans, we struggle at times in these relationships simply because we, at times, again, do not treat each other as we ought to treat each other. In regards to how we speak to one another, as we covered Tuesday night, how we act towards one another, or even how we don't act one towards another. A foundational passage to begin our discussion tonight, I would like for us to turn over now if you have your Bibles. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's look very briefly at verses 25 through 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Here we find in this particular text principles governing our life in Christ, the new life in Christ, and our relationships one with another. And really the context goes back to verse number 17, and really it deals with how we conduct ourselves towards all men. And really when you go back to verse 17, the context is a contrast in walk, in walks. How the ungodly walk, you don't walk that way as Christians, as those in Christ, but rather you walk the godly walk. You walk as those as children of light. You walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye have been called, as Paul implored in, in verse number 1. But when we go down to verse number 25, let's think about some principles for, for just a moment. Verse 25, it begins with how we are not to speak toward one another. How to speak and how not to speak. We need to put away lying. And rather, we need to speak every man truth with his neighbor. And that should be the ethic of every single Christian, is it not? To speak the truth. That should be the only thing that comes forth from our lips. Verses 26 and 27, we see the need to safeguard our emotions. We talked about this Sunday night in our lesson. Controlling our anger, controlling our temper. We must not give Satan an open doorway into our life through, through our emotions. It has been said that if you give the devil an inch, he'll take a foot, and then some. Uh, that's all it takes. You leave the door open to your heart. You just give it a crack, and the devil will force his way inside. If we are angry, we must be angry and sin not. And we must not let the sun go down upon our wrath. Verses 28 and 29 deals with the ethic of honesty, of right doing to be present in the life of, of God's people. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. Is work a good thing? Think about our society. Has the work ethic disappeared from our nation's fabric? I think we'd all agree. How many people living today are just simply living for a handout? Would we not say millions upon millions? It is right to work. It is a good thing to work. Working with our hands the thing which is good that, I, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Verse number 29 deals with our speech yet again to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Verse 30, we are implored to not resist the teaching of the Spirit given or directed word of God. Don't fight against it. Don't fight against what God has said. Don't resist. Don't reject it. Verses 31, we come back to how we treat one another or how not to. We must put away bitterness, put away wrath, put away that sinful anger, clamor, evil speaking, with all malice. But then we come to verse number 32, setting the stage for tonight. We are to forgive one another, as we talked about last night. But notice where it all begins. Notice how this first verse begins. Why do we forgive one another? What enables us, enables us to have that forgiving spirit? By being kind one to another. That's the phrase I want us to focus in on in this lesson tonight. 
There are many other passages that imply the need or explicitly affirm the need for kindness in our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. In the list of the fruit of the Spirit in the King James Version, gentleness really is better rendered as kindness, and we're going to demonstrate that when we define our terms here in just a moment. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 7, a virtue that we are to add to our faith is brotherly kindness. But above all, I guess it comes back to Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 12. The verse we often refer to as the golden rule. When Christ said there in the Sermon on the Mount, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, if we expect to be treated kindly, we must be willing to treat others with kindness. The need for and the imperative of kindness in our lives towards one another. Well, it's easy to sit, stand up here and talk about it. It's easy to do that. The difficulty comes when it comes time to putting it into practice in our lives. And therefore, as we think about Christian character tonight, there is an urgent, there is an imperative need for us to discuss the place and importance of kindness in the life of the child of God. And we're going to do that in this lesson, and we're going to do it by way of defining what we mean by kindness, the, disposi the overall disposition of kindness, what it is and what it is not, we're going to note biblical demonstrations of kindness and then how we develop this mindset in our own lives. We're going to show that, that kindness must. We must stress this, that it is imperative that it be found in our lives, that it, that it makes up our character as Christians. It is not just a mindset, but rather it is seen in our actions and it is seen in our words towards others. So tonight, as we get into our lesson, as we... Think about the concept of building kindness. First of all, let's define what we mean. And we want to begin with Galatians 5, verse 22. In the King James, as I already made mention, gentleness or, or kindness. And it's from, the Greek, it's from a Greek word, as you can see up there, which is, which is defined as moral goodness, integrity, benignity, or, or kindness. Now, having said that, before we go on any further in regards to our definition... I want to give you a list of translations in regards to how the fruit of the Spirit, how the Greek is translated. I already made mention of the King, King James Version. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. And it's that Greek word there, kreistotes. Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The English Standard Version in my study as I prepared this lesson, it renders the fruit this way, translates the original this way. Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, and that's that same Greek word there that the ESV renders kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now notice this, gentleness. Now, it transforms, trans, translates, doesn't transform, it translates the Greek word translated meekness, protes, there as gentleness, which is a better rendering in, in my opinion. And then, and then self-control. Self the ASV of 1901 lists the fruit this way love joy peace long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness meekness self control so too does young's literal translation in the modern literal version of today so it all comes down this original word is d deals with kindness per there strong goes on to add Usefulness, that is moral excellence in character, character or demeanor. Gentleness or kindness. Now it might help to, to explain the, the, uh, how this word originated, the etymology of the word. It means usableness. And it suggests sweetness of disposition. A willingness to comply. A, a willingness to be of service toward others. Barclay notes in his book, Flesh and Spirit, quoting Plummer, suggests that this term denotes the sympathetic kindliness or sweetness of temper which puts others at their ease and shrinks from giving pain. The importance of this fruit is that when it is manifested in our lives, it will show others 
that our desire for them is of the highest regard. And that includes when it comes down to, to preaching the gospel to the lost. We are demonstrating kindness toward them, are we not, when we do that? By showing that we care for them. We're concerned for their highest regard. We're concerned for their shuts, for their souls. Certainly it would be unkindness of the highest form if we refused to teach others the gospel, would it not? I think we all agree. This word is found in several other passages. It's translated kindness in passages such as 2 Corinthians 6 and verse number 6. Paul refers to it by kindness. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, a passage we're going to come back and deal with more later, where it translates the idea of riches in his, that is God's grace, and his kindness toward us. And contextually dealing with Christ and why he came to this earth and the work he accomplished by, by going to the cross, verses, verses 12 and following. In Colossians 3, verse number 12, we are exhorted in that list of things that we are to mortify or to put off that there are things we must put on and part of the things we must put on as character in our lives is bowels of kindness and then also Titus chapter 3 I have Titus chapter 2 verse 4 on the slide but really it should be Titus chapter 3 and verse 4 the kindness and love of God is described there in regards to Christ coming to this earth dealing with our salvation by God's grace through our faith so, so that's a basic meaning of what we are dealing with, really going back to the original word in the text. But then let's think about the word kind. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 32, and it's from a root word, krestos, which means fit for use. Useful, virtuous, good, manageable, mild, or pleasant, as opposed to harsh, hard, sharp, or bitter. In regards to people, deals with kindness or or benevolent. It's important to note in regards to this word that it's found in Matthew chapter 11 in verse number 30. And again, this is a passage we're going to come back to here a little bit later. But in that context, dealing with the great invitation of Christ, describing his yoke, he's saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word tr easy there is translated from the Greek word that is translated kind there in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 32. So how does it describe the yoke of Christ? As something when we come to Christ, the yoke he puts on us is that which is fit for use. It is good. It is manageable. It is mild. It's not like sin, the yoke of sin, which is harsh, hard, sharp, or bitter, is it not? But rather it is that which is kind which is designed for man's benefit. Barclay observes in connection with this that the service of Christ is not tyrannically imposed upon a man. It does not act like a slave driver. It is a kindly thing. And the task Christ gives a man is tailor-made for him. And that's a good comment, is it not? Christ is not a slave driver. We are servants of righteousness as as Christians, but we're not a ta under a taskmaster, master or a slave master. That, that that's what sin is. Slave is a sin is a hard slave master, and its rewards are death. But you think about the reward that Christ gives His servants if we're faithful: heaven, eternal life. That's the beauty of taking Christ's yoke upon us, is it not? That's what it's all about. That's what it's designed for: is to bring man bring men unto God. But then thirdly, there's brotherly kindness. 2 Peter 1 verse 7. It, it's from the Greek word Philadelphia. There's a reason why the city of Philadelphia is referred to as the city of brotherly love because that's the root, that's the meaning of that word. It's the love of brothers or sisters. It's brotherly love. It's the love of which Christians cherish for each other as brethren, and of course we understand that this type of love is agape love, or we might say 1 Corinthians 13 love. But then also there's Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10, and again I got it wrong on the slide, I, I have 10, 10 when it should be 12, 10. Kindly affectioned, be ye kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. And it's from a compound word, philostorgos, 
Of course, we understand those are from the Greek words phileo and storge. And Thayer defines it as cherishing one's kindred, fond of natural relatives, that is, fraternal, towards fellow Christians. And so it's dealing with fondness, affection, and, and kindness towards one another. A word that I didn't put on the slide but I think is crucial to our discussion and certainly it plays a part in the work of the church is benevolence, being benevolent. And Webster defines that word as the disposition to do good. So why is it important that we, do be, we, that we be benevolent towards one another and towards all men? Because it simply is the disposition to do good. It's an act of kindness. Generous gift, as Webster defines. Of course, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10 will point this verse out again at the end of the lesson tonight, time permitting. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those of the household of faith. When we do good, we're showing kindness towards others. Now, understanding what we mean by kindness Let's seek to understand its disposition. How does it manifest itself? Well, number one, it's, it's the idea of kindness is, has that disposition to be pleasing. It wants to please, but the important thing is it does not desire to please self. It's not selfishness, but rather it is selflessness. It has the desire to please. First of all, it has the desire to please God first. That's its ultimate goal. It's pleasing God. But also pleasing others, doing good unto others, showing interest in others, serving others. And as Christians, we all are servants. We're all ministers in a sense because we're servants of God. We are servants of righteousness. In fact, the New Testament tells us to serve one another in love. It has that disposition. Secondly, Kindness's disposition deals with mildness of temper, a calmness of spirit. It's an unruffled disposition. It doesn't go flying off the handle at every little thing. And again, this is why we talked about Sunday night, the need to, to have self-control of our emotions, to not let every single little thing just get to us. Kindness has this disposition. It has the disposition, thirdly, to treat others with politeness. Now, we need to understand that it does not exclude. It does not exclude the firmness that is required to be faithful to God. Let's, let's get that out of the way. You know, we think about Christ. He said he was meek and lowly, and indeed he was. Perfect Lamb of God. Do you remember how he's described in the book of Revelation as well? As being a lion Lion of the tribe of Judah. So, so Christ is both a lamb and a lion. Think about he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. You think about what he did when he was personally attacked. He didn't retaliate. But what happened when, his, when the doctrine that he taught was attacked? When the ways of God were attacked? Did he not defend those? Indeed he did. He refuted the doctrines of men. See Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 23 is a couple of examples. So it does not exclude the firmness required to be faithful to God. It does not de deny the strength of righteousness or holiness, nor does it deny the place of righteous indignation. It does not indicate one who is spiritually spineless. Don't you... I get the pit feeling a lot of times people just, you know, look upon Jesus. They think about him being meek, and they sort of look upon Jesus as being a timid, a timid man. Do they not? To hear some people tell it. Jesus was meek. Meek and lowly. Possessed humility. But yet there came time when the lion came out. And, and so too that must be said of us. But there, we have to know when to be a lamb and when to be, be a lion. But this is what kindness does. Nor does it imply we must look the other way in matters of eternal importance in which the truth is at stake. 
Yes, we treat others with politeness, but times, but we must deal with people at times with, with that firmness required by God. Also, as we think about its disposition, it enables us to subdue all things that are harsh and hasty. It enables us to make the right choices, we might say. It en enables us to encourage that which is good in, in general. Above all, it's the disposition to do good toward others without solicitation. It's the idea of showing grace, as it were. We need to be able to do that in our lives as Christians. We don't need to be poked or prodded. We don't need to be begged or anything to do good. We should be, we should be willing to do good naturally. But it also faces and handles every situation delicately talked about this in several other lessons. It thinks before it speaks and it examines the situation as to how to handle it properly. This is what kindness does. But now having said that, let's look at some practical demonstrations and it begins with God. We have to think about God first of all. Think about the kindness God has shown toward us. Psalm 8 verse 4. Think about what David wrote there. What is man, Lord? that thou art mindful of him. Question, is God mindful of us? We might ask why. Why would God be so mindful of us? Is it not because he loves his creation? The fact that God is mindful demonstrates that God is a good God, he is a loving God, he is a kind God, he is a benevolent God. But we also understand he's a severe God as well. A God of great holiness, a God of justice. But yet we must emphasize to people that those facts, but also emphasize that God wants what is best for them. Does God want to punish anyone for sin? Does God really desire to see men punished? Absolutely not. And that's why he's so graciously provided men with provisions. You think about, first of all, think about the fact in Luke 6, 35, that God has shown kindness to even those who are unthankful and who are evil. It's demonstrated physically. Matthew 5, 44 and 45, he makes the sun to fall, to shine on both the good and the evil, makes the rain to fall on both the just and the unjust. God's mindful. But above all, let's think about this fact. Salvation. Jumping ahead just a little bit on the slide, we're not going to get to that verse just yet, but you think about God's kindness and his making and providing provisions for our salvation. Question. Did God have to provide a way for man to be saved from sin? Did God, did, did, does man deserve it? Did God have to do that for us? No, he did not. His holiness, his justice demands severe punishment for sin. And we understand what the punishment is, death. Romans 6, 23. However, his love, his grace, his mercy, really we might sum it up with this one word, kindness, has made it possible for all man, men to enjoy the blessing of salvation. Think about certain passages in the New Testament. What Paul wrote to Timothy, God would have all men to be saved come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Think about that. Think about how much God loves mankind. Think about how much kindness he has shown to mankind and making it possible and giving us time to be, to, to be saved from sin. Now having said that, let's turn over now to Ephesians chapter 2 and let's look at verses 1 through 7. And let's look at the, this, the ultimate loving kindness to mankind, how it's ultimately summed up. Through and in Christ Jesus the sacrifice of his son. And let's read this section, and, I'll, and I want us to begin with verses 1 through 3. Paul, in writing to these Ephesian Christians, says, verse 1, you hath he quickened 
that is, made alive, who were, that is, past tense, dead in trespasses and sins. We're in, in time past, again, referring to past condition, which goes on to verse 3. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now let's skip down. Notice their present condition. You, who's he referring to? These Ephesian Christians. He hath quickened. Again, quickened means to make it made alive. Well, what made it possible? Verse 4. God's mercy. Notice how he's described. God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even, even when we were dead in sins, it is through his mercy, his great love, that he hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are, ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now note verse 7 that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's the ultimate demonstration, is it not? Of what God has made possible for us. And again, note the context there, the past condition of the, of the Ephesians, dead in trespasses and sins, but notice what, had made, what, what they were now. They were in Christ Jesus. They were being quickened. They were reconciled. Well, again, how was it possible? Verse 7. His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Ultimately, it is in Christ Jesus. Again, we understand and we stress God is angered by sin, but His kindness manifested not only through His sending His only begotten Son to die, but also by his long-suffering gives man opportunity to change by obeying his will. Should we not be thankful for the kindness of God? Should we always be, we should always be thankful for that great kindness. Certainly, when you study the book of Psalms, do it in your spare time and, and look at how God's kindness is described throughout the book of Psalms. It's described in a variety of ways, in particular with the phrase loving kindness. And really, that's the ultimate source, the original source of kindness, God. Let's look at some other examples now of those who demonstrated kindness. Think about Rahab in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. We understand her occupation. She was a harlot. We know what that is in modern day vernacular. Very debased occupation, an occupation full of debauchery. But yet you think about the actions of Rahab here, how she turned her life around and her demonstrating kindness to these Jewish spies. Back we're told, verse number 7, that the men pursued after them the way to, the, to Jordan under the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Well, how did she know this? She had heard about their exploits. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Rahab heard she heard about God, what had happened. She believed it. Faith in action. Notice what she says, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint above you. But going on down to verse 12, because of this, notice her request. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will show me kindness unto my father's house and will give me a true token and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And we know the rest of the story, do we not? Rahab and her household were shown kindness, were they not? The men told her what to do and she did it. Great turnaround in the life of this woman. How do we know this? 
Well, you come over to the New Testament. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, in the context dealing with how faith without works is dead. Two individuals are mentioned there. Number one, obviously, Abraham. Who else did James mention in that context as demonstrating how they were saved or justified by God through working faith, obedience? Was it not Rahab? Then you go on into Hebrews chapter 11. And you will find this same woman mentioned in Faith's Hall of Fame. What a great testimony, is it not, from God? See what her kindness resulted in? She demonstrated kindness toward these Israelites and, and she turned her life around. Turned from sin and turn to God. Another great example is Ruth. Throughout the book of Ruth, really, and on, and on the part of, of all the main characters in that book, Ruth showed kindness toward Naomi and standing by her even after her husband died and after Ruth's husband died. We understand what Naomi told Ruth to, to go back to her land of Moab after her husband had died. But Ruth clave unto Naomi. Ruth showed kindness toward Boaz. Boaz affirmed there in, Gen in Ruth chapter 3 about how she did show kindness. He showed kindness toward her. Naomi showed kindness toward Ruth. The book of Ruth is an excellent book to study more in-depthly in regards to this point that we're striving to make tonight. Think about David. King David in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and is dealing with Jonathan's son Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was, was a lame man. And, noti and, and notice verse 1. David asked after Saul had died, he asked, is there any yet left that it, of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And we're told in verse number 2, there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. David asked, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show thee kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son. And remember, Jonathan was David's best friend, which is lame on, on his feet. The king said unto him, Where is he? Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. So David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness. For Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Notice the humility of Mephibosheth. What is thy servant that thou shouldst look, look upon such a dead dog as I am? You think Mephibosheth was touched by David's act of kindness? Indeed he was. And, and, and there he remained. We're told in verse 13, he dwelt, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table. And the chapter ends with the fact that he was lame on both his feet. David demonstrated tremendous, tremendous kindness toward Mephibosheth. David, the king of Israel. Oh, how much better would our society be if we had politicians who had a heart like David, who sought God's advice, who sought to follow God's will for their lives, and who sought to be kind, truly kind, rather than using people for their own personal gain. Obviously, you also have to think about Christ Jesus. You go back to the great invitation in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. It's a kind offering, is it not? When he invites men to come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. We are burdened by the load of sin, are we not? Christ offers to take that load off. We have a kind responsibility, as we just talked about a little bit ago, to take his yoke upon us. Again, what he desires from us is not above our capabilities. 
because he's going to give us a kind of blessing. I will give you rest. The removal of the burden of sin. Oh, what kindness Christ has shown. What kindness he offers to all mankind. But we have to be willing to come to him. All men must be willing to come to him. Now, understanding this, how do you and I develop kindness in our lives? Where does it begin? Well, simply put, it begins with the heart. The parable of the sower and souls deals with man's heart, does it not? It deals specifically with how we hear the word. And again, we understand the biblical heart is the mind, but that's where it begins. We need to have the Luke 8.15 kind of heart. Because Christ said it is on that good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, and that's the good ground of the parable, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. You see, if we have this kind of heart, we are going to hear God's word, and we're going to keep it. And the idea of keeping it there is doing it. Being a hearer and a doer of the word. Now what happens when we hear God's word and we do it? What's the end result? The text tells us we're going to bring forth, forth fruit with patience. We must bear fruit. That's why it's so important we develop that good and honest heart because when we do that, we're going to bring forth the right kind of fruit in our lives. Again, you think about Galatians 5, 22 through 24, the, the importance, the necessity of bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. What's the purpose for planting a tree, a fruit tree? What was the purpose in, in, in biblical times for, for planting trees in vineyards, in, in vineyards? Did not the husbandmen expect those trees that they, that they planted, that they worked on, that they, that they put time and energy in? Didn't they expect them to bear fruit? Isn't that the purpose for which a tree has been cultivated, has been planted? Think about the problem Christ talked about in the parable of the barren fig tree. What had happened there? And, and we understand the context dealing with the Jewish nation. God planted the tree, gave, gave it the choice, this location, took care of it. But what was wrong with that tree? Barren useless, lifeless. So what did the owner of the vineyard want to do to the tree? Did he not want to cut it down, get rid of it? Of course, he heard the plea. Live it alone. Give it another chance. Long suffering so that it could bear fruit again. As Christians, we must not be barren. We cannot afford to be fruitless. When we obey the gospel, we've been grafted into the true vine. Christ is the vine, we are the branches. John 15, 1 and following. And as branches in the vine, Christ expects us to bear the right kind of fruit, does he not? And part of the fruit we are to bear is to bear the fruit of kindness in our lives. We think about the fruit of the Spirit here, the, the idea of fruit bearing Notice the phrase, the Spirit. That's, that's the source of the fruit. What fruit is produced when we hear and keep the Word? Fruit of the Spirit. Again, that of the Spirit. The seed is the Spirit-given Word of God. Hermeneutical terms, the, the, the sower is used in, in place of the seed here. Sower referring to the Spirit, which delivered unto man through inspired men the written word of God. Used by way of metonymy here. And as Christians, when we sow the seed, we are teaching others the good news of the, the gospel, of God's word. And when it is sown and it is received, it's gonna, gonna, those people with the good and honest hearts will bring forth fruit. As a result, it is because we have been forgiven of our sins, which has been made possible, again, we stress, through the kindness of God. 
which encompasses his love, his grace, and mercy towards mankind, that we are to forgive others. Ephesians 4, verse 32. You see, this connects back into what we discussed last night. What enables us to, to be able to forgive others when they ask of us and when obviously when they repent? Kindness. That forgiving spirit comes from possessing a kind disposition. But then there's a third aspect to this, and that is we need to acquire the wisdom which is from above. James chapter 3. Let's turn over there very right quick. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. James talks about this, and in the context, after dealing with the tongue, he deals with wisdom. And, and certainly, do we not need this wisdom in how we speak? So it's a natural subject to come up, to be talked about after dealing with the tongue. He begins by asking the question, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom, descriptive of, of, of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. You see, there's two kinds of wisdom. There is divine, there's the wisdom from above, and then there is the wisdom of this earth. Verse 17 talks about the wisdom that we need, that which is from above. It's first pure, then peaceable, then gentle or kind, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. See why we need this, this wisdom? full of good fruits. When we choose wisdom from above, we're going to be bearing the right kind of fruit without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And it begins by making peace with God when we obey His will, having our sins forgiven. When we make peace with others and being reconciled unto them or they being reconciled unto us, through our willingness to forgive them. That's the importance of this wisdom. That's why it is vitally needed in our lives. You know, kindness, kindness is not something we're born with, is it? The little baby, when they're born, know how to be kind? Well, no. It's something we learn. It's something we have to be taught. It is something we develop, it's something we practice and we maintain over time. As Christians, if we are to be the salt and we're to be the light that God would have us to be, we must be kind and show kindness to others. There are several reasons. Number one, because kindness is a characteristic of the life that is becoming of the gospel of Christ. We must live that kind of life. Philippians 1 verse 27 as we have seen, it is fruit that must be cultivated in our life. It is a grace, that virtue, we must manifest among our own spiritual brethren, the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is that which shows we are truly concerned about lost souls and demonstrates our willingness to teach them the gospel of Christ, the good news of salvation. It is that which is manifested in our benevolence towards others. Number two, Kindness is a demonstration of the Christ-like conduct. He left us an example to follow, and you look back throughout the life of Christ recorded, his earthly ministry recorded in the four Gospels. He went about doing good, did he not? Did he show kindness toward others? Not just in miraculous healings, but in forgiving others. He had a kind disposition. So too must we. Number three, kindness is part of what it means to love one another. It is a demonstration of loving in deed and in truth. 1 John 3, verse 18. Failure to demonstrate a kind disposition one toward another is to manifest a lack of love toward one another. And 1 John 5, verse 20 tells us the consequence of that. How can we claim to love God whom we have not seen and hate, hate our brother whom we have seen? Fourthly, Kindness is part of the good that we must pursue in our lives. Remember what Paul said, we are to abhor the evil and cleave to that which is good. Kindness is a good thing. 
It's something we must pursue in our lives, and we need to pursue it and cleave to it. And in the same connection, number five, kindness enables us to overcome evil with good. Romans 12, verse 21. And in a world in which we want to overcome with, in a world in which men want to overcome evil with evil, oh, I'm going to get even with them. That shouldn't be who we are as Christians, should it? We need to overcome evil with good. Notice verse 20. Regarding our enemies, how should we treat our enemies? If they do wrong to us, should we just retaliate, get vengeance? Well, no, vengeance doesn't belong to us. Verse number 19 tells us that. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. You know what you were really doing? Killing them with kindness. And who knows, you may make an enemy a friend. You may convert an enemy of Christ into a servant of Christ with your influence. Thus may each of us diligently pursue to further develop and maintain the fruit of kindness in our lives, understanding that it is beneficial toward others, but to ourselves as well, and that it prevents negative and destructive mindsets, as Paul talked about there in the context of Ephesians 4 such as malice, bitterness, and wrath from developing in our lives, which results in destructive actions, all of which can and will keep us from heaven. This week we've talked about basic attributes, basic characteristics that we need in our lives as Christians. We've striven to discuss what it means to build Christian character. Let us never lose sight of the importance of the fruit of kindness in our lives. May God bless us as his children as we seek to develop, to further grow in this fruit. God bless you. Thank you so much for your kind attention.